Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the living room and thank you for joining us for today's pep talk with Mia Street. Um, how are the children? And just like dealing within the classroom and with youth and school in general, issues pop up every day, how you handle them tells you who you are and how you are as an educator. So thank you, Mia, for being an excellent educator and I must be one as well. So. Um, we're gonna move forward with this introduction and then we'll jump right into uh, the show. So here we go. The disparities in our school discipline system, both nationally and here in Dallas, call attention to the need for change in our school culture. The use of zero tolerance practices and the over discipline of youth of color, specifically black youth, have continued the flow of black boys and girls into the school to prison pipeline. Our educational system spends vast amounts of money for security services and minuscule amounts comparatively on the mental and emotional well being of our youth. Systemic racism, racist practices, and policies have impacted communities of color, but specifically Black communities, creating wealth and achievement gaps that spill into our school system. Implicit bias a lack of cultural awareness, consistently criminalize Black student behavior while dismissing and minimizing the same behavior in other students. Zero tolerance policies and practices are proven not to change students' behavior, but increase aggression and disengage youth from the learning process. Learning is not one size fits all. Moving our educational culture from deficit thinking toward a whole child approach is the goal of PEP. And joining me today is the phenomenal Mia Street. She's joined, she's gonna talk about how the children are today. Mia, welcome to the show and thank you for being here. And if you could do a short, not even short, do your own introduction and tell me, tell, tell everyone about you and who you are. My name is Mia Street. I am a student services uh, coordinator for my school district, which we won't mention tonight. <laughs> Uh, just in case, so we need not to. Um, <laughs> I am an activist, a philanthropist, and um, I am a, a, a fighter for the least of these. So when it comes to our students, I like to consider myself someone that's carrying on the tradition of my ancestors who, who want to make sure our children are well. Yes, very good. You know, um, thank you for that because uh, we're talking about how black kids are affected because disproportionately, and we're gonna use big words for a little while and then we'll get right into it, but disproportionately our kids, our youth are being affected uh, negatively by the policies and, and systems that are in place. Um, and it's time that we be unapologetic in how we approach black youth and the education of our youth. So I'm glad to have you today. I really am. I uh, got a chance to sit on a panel with you and it was amazing. So I'm gonna ask you, tell me why you're in education and tell me about your mentoring program, which is amazing. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I come from a long line of educators. Uh, my grandfather, Moses Lee Osborne, uh, he actually, um, in a small community called uh, St. Rest, Louisiana, he tried, or he did, teach um, a community of African-American folks to, teach, uh, he, to, to read. And um, he almost lost his life doing that. Yeah, so the Klan came and, and uh, roughed him up and put a gun to his head. So I come from that. I come from uh, a group of folks who would not allow the Klan to come in and burn down a church a third time in Louisiana. And they helped to create the Deacons of Defense, which begat the Black Panthers. So I come from that. So it's in my DNA. <laughs> it's in my Very DNA. <laughs> Um, it's in my DNA to, to basically, like I said before, fight for the least of these. When we have students that are coming from these, these places where they don't have all the resources, they don't have the love, they don't have the trust, 
and we can talk about that a little bit later. Yes, we will. But um, they don't have the belief that educators need to have in our students to do well. Um, I feel like someone has to speak for them. And there's plenty of us. It's not just me, it's plenty of us. But but my my goal is to not only be a beacon for them, but then also to provide a, a pathway for, for kiddos who, who need it. Um, and that's what my ancestors did, and that's what I plan to do and what I do. Very good. Um, you know, it, 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 I, I've started, I started writing uh, something that I was, a report that I was going to put out, and it was coming after Black History Month, and we were talking, you know, I was thinking about how our education system is still ensconced in slavery. You know, it was against the law for, like you said, for, for our kids to learn how to read, for education. And we, when we think about the current system, we are still following the same system. We don't, we don't support, we don't talk about equity, and there's a difference in equality and equity, and there's a difference in how you approach students. Like I said, student, one learning is not one size fit all. So tell me about your mentoring program. So Bridging the Gap Mentoring Program, I, it started in 2006, actually. So in 2005, uh, I was at a high school. I've only really done secondary education. So, um, <clears throat> and uh, one of the assistant principals came to me and he was like, look at these, look at this data. And he was from South Central Los Angeles, okay? So him coming to me, like, this is an alert. I was like, oh, I know it's, it's serious. If you, someone who has experienced the gang violence, the, the, the trauma that happened in the 80s and the 90s with our communities from central South uh, Los Angeles, you're coming to me to tell me about our kids here in the suburbs of Dallas. So we need to have a conversation. So it was very important. Um, his name was Dr. Land, love him to death. Um, Dr. Land was like, we need to do something. So he gave me the data. I love data. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I have a mm -hmm. thing about numbers. I have a thing. Look, Jay-Z said it. Numbers don't lie, right? No. So no. <laughs> numbers don't <laughs> lie. And so I absolutely love um, sitting down with him, talking to him about how we can create something for our students um, at that particular campus. And so that summer I spent researching all types of um, information about the achievement gap. And that's where Bridging the Gap um, was birthed from. So I looked at, you know, how can we, um, you know, close the achievement gap? And so what I did with that was um, present a proposal. The, the principal at the time, Cindy Boyd, who I don't, Look, if you ever met her, you would know she's the realest. Like, I love that woman to death. So I, I, I gave her the, the, the proposal and in five minutes, so she's like, yeah, we're doing this. Um, <laughs> and so I got to pick um, students who were African-American, who were just amazing kiddos, who were striving um, for excellence at an academic level. And then I got to also choose students who needed a little extra help. And I paired them together. The concept was built on the fact that um, peer mentoring was stronger than having anything else. I can't talk to you like how your peer can, you right. know? Yeah. I'm not gonna be in every class that your peer is in, but they will be. So they can hold you accountable and you can hold them accountable. And so that was kind of how Bridging the Gap peer mentoring came from. Uh, and the first meetings we would have every year, I would ask students, what do you wanna be? What do you wanna be? And they would tell me. And so my job was to go out and find someone that, that had their same, their, their same cultural journey. And they would talk to them about how they became whatever it is the student wanted to be. So, I was struck one year with a hard task to find uh, someone who, um, and I can't think of the term now, but basically someone who's a fisher. I can't gotcha. think of the term. Yes, 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 okay. yes, yes. One of my students, he 
amazing kid. He came to me and said, Miss, I want to be whatever the term is, Fisher for like a living. And I was like, a Fisher? I need to find a black male Fisher. <laughs> fisherman okay. that's making a living off of this so he can mentor you yes okay and i think it's an anchorman i think that's the term that might be it okay. but i i and so i spent a lot of my time um you know just connecting with different organizations going to different events so i could connect them to my students and, you know, on a teacher's salary, it's not easy, no. but, you know, and then the other part of it was to also provide scholarships and then also to provide um, parent engagement and education and how they can support their students in um, their academic journey. Because what 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 it had, I found was the huge issue and it still is. What we don't know, we don't know. Right. So Randall Robinson talked about that years ago, uh, one of my favorite authors, but um, he talked about how what we don't know, we don't know. And so how can we engage our parents into learning things that they need to know so that they can really support their children? Because we are coming off of, right, um, an education system that wasn't made for us. So Not we've thrown all. our children, all right? So, so um, Brown versus Board of Education didn't give folks a, a, um, a list of things to do to introduce our kids to education system as it was. And, and it didn't uh, introduce the educators that ended up being in charge of our children, uh, a list of things to do. So part of that is how do we engage our families into being advocates yes. for our children and then also giving them the tools so that they can navigate the system that we have to be in. That's, you know, so I was, I was out of school today, um, spoke with a, a dynamic principal. We were talking the same thing and, it, and it's, it, is, it is not just that you're educated and you're edu and you're you have this position and that you're that you know you believe in education it is actually that you have to understand that when you're taught by a system mm -hmm. you take on the, the 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 characteristics of that system and if you don't fight to make that change then you're going to continue the disparities and the the issues that are faced that are part of that system and that is what I think we're not understanding because we're creating culture, a culture that's not supported. And I don't think it's intentional in some senses. I agree. But it's still happening. So, and what you're talking about, it's amazing that you said, so when I started <laughs> my program, Destination Known, it's the same thing that I wanted to do, right? So how do we find showing kids that what they think is valuable, right? It's viable, it's valuable. There's somebody that's doing it. It's not always college, it's it's a living, right? Because that's the intention of education is to make you economically sound, right? So how important is culture, school culture? How important is student perception? And how does that tie into what you believe and what you're doing? So school culture sets the tone for everything. I have to pause because. Right, you know I'm leading you into something because I know you. <laughs> I have to pause. Go ahead, because, go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. But I'm learning in, in, in this new role is um, depending on your leadership on a campus, uh, your culture is going to be either inclusive or it will traumatize children. Yes. Okay. And that's, that's, that's doctors. That's, uh, we're talking about people that are educated. We're not talking about just, yeah, 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 yeah. I just want to clarify. That's all. Keep going. Yeah. So. I'll, so what I'm going to do is give you the uh, the result of a positive school culture. 
Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Go for okay. it. Okay. Yes, so um, when we moved, I moved from moved here from the Bay Area um, in the in the early nineties. So get here, end up at Newman Smith High School, and the principal was Dr. Uh, Alvoy. And she made sure her and her team, let me, because I, I don't know how the dynamics work, but she made sure that um, our African-American students were taken care of. And she hired some of the most dynamic educators who fed into us and they took care of us. That's my experience. From that, we learned how to advocate for ourselves. We had so many different organizations and, and programs um, to celebrate our culture, to celebrate every culture that was represented at that high school. She advocated for us. She sent us on different um, leadership programs so that we understood that we could be leaders and we had a voice from maybe the from my class and probably class like a class before us and then a few classes after us we have doctors we have attorneys we have engineers you see what i'm saying um, and we all speak highly of our experience because the school culture that she set and put in place and made sure was there um cultivated black excellence let me, let me interrupt you real quick. Let me, mm -hmm. let me ask you a question. Okay. Because I'll give you the, is it only kids going, is it college ready that creates black excellence? No, no, it doesn't. And, and, and let me just say this. Okay. Um, you know, before this position, I was a CCMR specialist. So I understand the difference between college ready and career ready. Yes. And I advocate for both. Uh, it just so happened that we all went to college is, and most of us went to HBCUs. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. And just thrived. Right. Um, and I don't think she even, I don't think that was even in her plan. I think she was just like, let me get these kids ready, you know, yeah. um, and uh, so from that idea, when we talk about college and career readiness for our kiddos, the lack of knowledge behind that is scary. So in my school district, we have so many certifications that our students could actually attain before graduating and getting a full-time job and, and, and being self-sufficient. But for some reason, it's not connecting. Like the information that goes out um, that that, sh that we can share with parents, it doesn't connect. And so um, I think that is a gap that we have when it comes to parents in general, but specifically when we talk about uh, parents of color coming from uh, disenfranchised communities, there's a huge gap in, uh, in understanding that your child could literally walk out of high school and have a certification in, in a profession that could uh, earn them a, a successful living. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I just I I I wanted to interrupt that that thought process. Yeah. <laughs> because we do spend we spend so much energy, resources, and time on college ready, mm -hmm. right? And then we we it's we downplay or we don't yeah. create as much hype for kids that are that are going that and we're talking 40 50% sometimes of our student body that aren't choosing college. Yeah. And what does that say to them? So I didn't mean to interrupt. I did mean to interrupt your story. I just wanted to make <laughs> sure that we don't get lost on the only option is is that like you know an anchorman they mm -hmm. You know, you have to find that and you have to figure out how important that is. Second part of that question, I was asking you the importance of self, uh, self perception in our students. So, okay. So before social media, there's a different conversation, 
right? Mm -hmm. With social media and after a pandemic, after a shutdown, the conversation becomes a little bit more traumatic because our students' self-perception is often defined by what they're seeing online. And unfortunately, we don't always get a chance to um, do a good job of teaching them that they're better than what they're seeing, that the images that they're being fed aren't real. And so um, we don't get enough of feeding into them and pouring into them and loving them before they can get online and determine who they are. Because if we had those moments with them and we could tell them that, hey, everyone goes through you know, A, B, C, and D, and everyone feels this way. And, and let me give you some tools on how to deal with those emotions. If we had more SEL, right? If we have more restorative practices, right? Then our children would understand that what they're seeing online doesn't define them, right? And so self-perception is built in um, not only you know, saying who you are is okay and, and we're growing and all that good stuff, but it's also built, built, built in um, cultural acceptance. Nice. Who are you? Okay. Where do you come from? And the issue with our kids, and everybody knows this, and this is why we, ha we are having issues with CRT, right, is if we can well, lie to you. Find CRT. Define CRT for those that may not know. Okay, cultural, okay, well. So CRT is, from my perspective, before this other mess, uh, it's cultural responsive teaching, yes, right? Or cultural responsive pedagogy. Yes, ma'am. What um, some other folks have liked to call it uh, is critical race theory. Yeah. Critical race theory didn't have acronyms <laughs> beforehand, but moving on. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay, so cultural responsive teaching says, I see who you are and I will respond to that in my pedagogy. Nice. So that means when you come in your, when I, when you come to my classroom, I know who you are. I know how to teach you because I've taken time to learn your background, to learn who your people are. I don't, yeah. you know, you're not from, you, where are you from, New York? Uh, I'm not from Texas, so yeah. You're, okay, we, but where we, are you from we, again? Uh, D.C. Okay, oh, okay, okay. All right, so down south, we ask who your people are. Okay, so as an educator, my job is to learn who your people are, where you come from, um, to learn your intellectual legacy, which is what Dr. Lisa Delpit talks about all the time. Um, and so that means I can incorporate all of that into my instruction. Yes. So that means I have a hook. So when you come into my classroom, I, already, I know who you are. I can speak to who you are. And the issue is, is that we don't have enough educators that know how to do that seamlessly. Yes. Right. Uh, without bias. So we're not doing uh, we're not doing the Dougie. Wait a minute. Hold on. <laughs> I'm not done. Now. On. Hold on. You know this. We're not we're not doing the Dougie. To teach math. Yes, ma'am. Yes. We're not doing these special handshakes. Yes, ma'am. To greet kids. We, we are at a deeper level of culture. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so I can hook kids on that. So I don't know if I answered the question, but that was my. You did. You did. So, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Like <laughs> no, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. We, I'm going to. So let me clarify. I was born in Orlando. I grew up in DC. So I okay. have that down south, but I've always been a, a child of the city. So. Okay. 
and I want to clarify that because my my folks gonna see that bit. Oh, he just don't even want to be nah. <laughs> I grew up in DC. I I was born in Orlando. Okay. <laughs> but, but on top of that, what you just said was we're not talking about culturally relevant teaching is not just the handshake, right? You don't get to come in and just high five and do all of that. That's that doesn't mean you understand me. Exactly. It is it is taking the time. So you answered it. And it's important to, because we tiptoeing and I want to be for real, but I can't, you have to be. I don't, I don't plan to tiptoe tonight. Okay, good. So now you can't just talk about that foolishness like that. You don't get to slap somebody on the hand and give my a handshake and say that it's this. And you you get to talk to me any kind of way. And you don't and, really and know me. Can we add one more thing? Yes, ma'am. Putting more educators of color. Yes. And in, in, in the building doesn't, doesn't mean. Doesn't anything. do it either. Come on now, because you know, and, and I'm not going to mention, yes, I am, because I, I don't mind funding it and tied to that. You know, Dallas ISD is a majority educa educators, administrators, uh, all of that of color. Culturally relevant doesn't mean that you just speak to my blackness. Yeah. It exactly. means it speaks to my economic situation. It speaks, exactly. like, you have to understand. The difference between, uh, like you said, bougie and and you know, because you you know when you go to HBCU, you get all of that. That you know, school days talked wonderfully about that, and you exactly. have to understand that that's a real thing. Yeah, and it's a real thing not just in black communities, but in all of our communities, because that's what Fred Hampton was talking about when he was he went to a certain demographic. So when we start talking about culturally relevant and culturally competent. You have to check yourself and understand where you're coming from, who you're talking to. So I have a story about that. Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Come on now. So, let's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm done today. Let's go. Okay. So, you know, I, I went to Grambling State University. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Grambling State University. I'm Virginia my Union myself. Virginia Union myself. So I okay. get it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So... At Grambling, um, I came I came from upper middle class, right? Get to Grambling, and I learned that everybody's not a Cosby kid. That's what I called myself. Mm -hmm. Got you. Okay. Yeah. My mom and dad did very well. Uh, my family, you know, very educated. And um, I met some folks from from Michigan. I met some folks some folks from uh, you know Los Angeles, the Bay. And I was like, oh, we're not, we're not where I thought yes. we were. I thought we were Cosby kids. And I had to learn. That was a new level of learning. I had to understand about my people, right? Yes. Graduate from Grambling, go to Louisiana Tech, get a job teaching. <laughs> um, <laughs> a few years later, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm good. I think I understand us, okay? And I think I understand us at all levels, at all economic levels. And 2018 happens. Mm. I'm co-teaching. I come from a special ed background. I was a special ed teacher. And I'm co-teaching. And um, can I'm not going to cuss, but I'm going to use the terms. Girl, this is frank conversation <laughs> about education. Okay. And can't nobody get more raggedy than me. So let's go. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so so um one of this this young, like beautiful little girl. Every every once in a while she was late to class, right? And um and this is this is in where I graduated from, the high school I graduated from. And so this is my first year back into that community for years. So I wasn't aware of what all I was doing. I thought we was back where I was. You know, do you understand what I'm saying? Like I, I, I didn't know it was what it was. I didn't mm -hmm. know we were section eight. I didn't know we were dealing with extreme poverty. I didn't know we were dealing with all of the stuff. So she comes into class every every now and again, she's she's late. Eventually she becomes later and later and later. 
And so I'm leading the class and I tell her to sign the tardy book. And she looks at me and she says, F-U-B. And she's a little black girl, right? And my feeling was, why would she say that to me? I love her. Off the rip, I love her. Why would she say that to me? And I have, I've only told her to do what other teachers have told her to do. But she sees my skin. She sees the skin I'm in. And I'm going to get it. If nobody else is going to get it, I'm going to get, <laughs> yeah. get it. Okay, so I said, I said, go ahead and go to the office. Because my Louisiana DNA said I should have cussed her out. <laughs> but my answer is to let her We're make it. There soon. Got you, right? Let that baby make it and love on her. And so when I got to the office, I told her she hurt me. I said, I don't know why you all are treating the only black teacher y'all have like this. And she cried. Hmm. She said, Miss. I don't mean to do you like this. She said, I haven't eaten. Huh. So I'm late. It's because I'm finally getting something to eat. I said, oh, you hangry. That's why I got cussed out. Okay. I said, I can, I can deal with hangry. Right. Baby girl, tell me what you need. <laughs> and so <laughs> she explained to me that um, it, it was a, a long story. But essentially that her mom and family have been dealing with not having food regularly. And so yeah. if um, the bus, school bus, does not get her to school on time, she misses breakfast. And so she's to a point where she has to eat something. And so she will go and get something for lunch and then make it back to the campus on time. Um, if she doesn't make it back on time, she's late. And so she has to sign in late. But that day, she wasn't having it. And so I told her, I said, you know what? I said, you don't have to cuss me out no more. Um, you just tell me when you're hungry. And when we'll you're hungry, it. right? We'll fix it. And so that was um, my realization that our babies were not okay. That's when I was like, it doesn't matter what suburb you live in. No. It doesn't matter what hood you live in. No. It doesn't matter what city you live in. We have children that are in need. Yes. And if we are going to be educators of color, we have to go 150% times harder to make sure they're okay. And so um, I just pulled her and a few other kids aside and I, just, I, I sat them down and I, I was like, what's going on? What I learned from those conversations with them and then other students was that they were experiencing racism. They didn't know how to advocate for themselves. They were experiencing poverty. Um, and that was something that they were ashamed to talk about because they understood that their parents' uh, ego was tied to all of that. And then also, they were experiencing not knowing what to do because at this time I'm, in high, I'm I'm teaching high school. So we're talking 11th graders, right? So they don't even know what to do next. So it was just a, a, a combination of so many things. And um, I was just like, okay, how can I at least be a little bit of help to get you to be self-sufficient and advocate for yourself? So, yeah. You Did know, all the questions. Yeah. That, what you're saying, you answered the question perfectly and you led to something else. So, you know, we talk about like deficit, deficit teaching, deficit learning and that yeah. approach. And, you know, I, I can't stand Ruby. What's Ruby's, Ruby Payne? Ruby Payne. They, they we won't, uh, let me not say that on, because it's going on YouTube and I, I, I Actually I Go ahead. Can we, can we pause real quick? I need to yeah. take Yeah. And then I'll be right back. Go ahead. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. I'll be We're right back. We're going to take a short break. 
You guys, yes, hold on. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ready? Yes. Sorry. No, oh, no, no, no. We're we're back. So Ruby Payne and deficit thinking. What you just talked about. If you have a certain mindset, you'll think, well, you'll start seeing the the deficiency, right? Mm -hmm. And you'll start thinking that it's this and it's that without laying blame where it should be, because we're going back to talking about slavery, about the edu the ability that we didn't have the opportunity, you know, the board of the Brown versus, versus the Board of Education, the not, uh, redlining, all those things that have created wow. these situations. And then you're gonna say, oh, well, these kids have, no, sir and ma'am, you've created these this, this environment, I am, more than capable of surviving in this environment, this hostile environment that you've created. I've done, I am resilient, I'm brilliant. I've come to school and done things and fallen in line as best I could with all the roadblocks that you've set in place and you consider me at risk or if I'm at risk of anything, it's your foolishness. So that's where I stand with Ruby Payne. And uh, I can't stand a woman. I can't stand people don't who do follow it. that. Don't, don't do it. Okay. You're about to say it. Go ahead, say it. No, 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 no. I'm not going to say it because I need a job later. So <laughs> <laughs> don't say it. I want to listen, listen. I'm going back to get my, my school social worker, uh, psychologist degree. So, I mean, licensure. So I don't, you know, I'm really being funny. I, I really don't care. But. That's what you're talking about. So we don't see these kids as deficient. That's not what you're talking about. What we're really talking about is equity. And how do you teach them how to perceive themselves as strong young black men and women, despite all of that? So you mentioned a really, really good thing. And that was roadblocks, Thank you. right? Um, and I got to do a bid and I call it a bid with middle school. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever met a middle school kid. Yes. They, different. they built That's different. What I like to deal with. I love it. Oh, you I love that? that? Yes. Okay. No, thank you. Never yes. again. <laughs> one year was good enough. I did a one year bid <laughs> at the middle school, Lyle's middle school, um, under some amazing leadership. Uh, so, um, I had a principal. Uh, so let me just say this. The campus, before I got there, these kids were breaking into to teachers' cars, fighting. It was like, it would, it, remember when, um, was it not school days? Uh, I'm trying to think. Um, Joe Clark, the movie. Yes, 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 yes. What was the movie called? Uh, Lean on Me. Lean, Lean on, on me. me. It was Lean on Me. Okay. Before I got there, it was lean on me. He shows up 
he starts putting things in order. So he understood how to, you know, change school culture and things yeah. like that. Yeah. So thankfully I got there in time when, when things had already started changing. And I remember meeting with him, a uh, brilliant, brilliant educator, like a brilliant mind. And he, he taught me one, um, how to, and I don't think he meant to teach me this, but he did. Uh, what does learning look like in a classroom, right? So if you're walking by a classroom, what are the few things you need to be able to see and hear and feel so that you know learning is happening? And then the other thing he taught me was when we're talking about our children, understanding the roadblocks that they have to go through just to make it into your building. Right, come on now, come on. Just to make it into your building, not to even be ready to learn. No, no. And he said, there, I forgot the number he gave me, but he said, Mia, there's such and such amount of roadblocks. They have to just get here. And so if we don't have teachers that understand that this is that, they're not going to get it. So they're going to be pissed off when a kid doesn't have paper or a pencil or a backpack or whatever. Because they don't understand this kid just slept in another apartment with no electricity. Mom was out doing whatever. They may have been abused. They may have seen, you know, something crazy happen that night. But we're going to get on them about not having a pencil. Or, or talking back in the class when I'm just trying to survive. Yeah. And then we're going to step into the fact that you're not making this relevant to what I have to, what you, to, we were talking about this today. I went to see Dr. Shambly and out in DeSoto and I, yeah. I, I absolutely love her. She's amazing. Met, yes, I met a principal that was absolutely amazing. I saw some kids that were absolutely amazing. And yeah, they were, but it's, you, you gotta see them being kids. They are not, you are not, we are not teaching them anything relevant. After yeah. sixth, fifth or sixth grade, we're talking about you're getting ready to go into life, right? Mm -hmm. You taught me my ABCs. You taught me if I'm not going to college, please tell me what is relevant to why I need to be here. It, it's not culturally relevant. It's not important to what I see on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not helping me function in a way that I think it needs to. So how are you going to engage me when it's not doing those things? And it was amazing to hear a principal that spoke about what you're talking about, like those roadblocks <laughs> and knowing that we have to change how we teach. Education is not teaching to the test. Education is not telling a kid, I don't even like to be told what to do. You know what I'm saying? Me neither. I, to let me learn how I learn. Give me the, the parameters. I'm probably going to try them. But, <laughs> and I'm getting paid well for a living. So what do you expect these kids to do? I, I, I'm just not understanding what we're not getting for education. You know what? You know what is, um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll say this. Mm -hmm. One thing I absolutely love about my job is uh, I got to, this year was the first time I was, um, I had two black women mm. I report to. Nice, nice. One who has this crazy mind for policy and law. And then the other one who, one of the only black women in, in the state of Texas who has her role, right? She, it's, it might be like six or seven of them. I did the numbers a years ago when she first got appointed to being assist, assistant superintendent. And I was like, oh, you know. So she's like one of the, she was one of the only ones. Um, and in that position, um, the assistant superintendent decided to start having what we call these real talks. And she reached out to me, this is in 2019, and was like, hey, I want to do these real talks on, and, and I want to only have students, not those like AP kids, 
Thank you. Come on, come on, come on. Keep talking. Start to get. Go ahead. I'm gonna shut up. Let you keep going. <laughs> she wanted to have the kids who have really experienced the data. Yes. You see what I'm saying? Yes. That speaks to what we see in our data. Yes. And so I shit you not. Yesterday we were at a campus, and you know what the kids told us? You know what they told us? Teachers. Do not teach to us. Thank you. They say we know when te teachers are teaching the way they've taught for decades. So you're not one getting to know us. You're not changing the pedagogy and the instruction to to meet our needs. And I, I don't even know what question we ask them. Oh, I, oh, I know what it was. I, I asked them to tell me, um, you know, what makes a good teacher for them. And that's what they told us. They also told us that a lot of the teachers are racist. And we weren't, it was two black kids in, in, in the room. So what I understood from that was at least this generation. They know. Latinx, white, and black kids, they can call out racism with more certainty and understanding than other generations. So all of that to say is, is that our kids, this generation, if nobody else is going to check us, they will. They, they will. Them. They will. And you know, I, 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 we were talking about this today and it was amazing to hear that and then to hear you echo this. We have, we're all on social media we act like these kids don't know that these teachers hate their job. We act like these kids don't know that teachers are leaving. We act like these kids don't know that they don't want to be there. So why would I want to be there? And that's exactly what they say. They, okay, so yesterday they were like, miss, we know they don't like us. They and know they don't, you. we know they don't like being here. And they, un, so, so what I told them, cause you know, I'm an educator. So I said, you got to give them grace, just like we have to give you guys grace, because y'all on these, y'all on these pills and on weed and coming to school <laughs> crazy, <laughs> thinking this is this is TikTok. It's actually your classroom. Mm -hmm. You can't slap somebody upside the head and, and then yes. think you record it and laugh and then continue. No, you know, um, you can't have a fight club in a bathroom and yes. not think there's going to be a consequence. Yeah. So give your teachers grace because we're all going through it right now, especially after COVID or yes. while we're dealing with COVID because we're still dealing oh, with it, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. And so I feel like whenever I say that, because we've done these real talks throughout the district, whenever I say that, they're like, oh, yeah, you're right. You're right, miss. But the, the other side of that is this. We're adults, and my father, and call Ray Street, <laughs> always reminds me, children don't ask to be here. So it's not on them. It's on us. We finally got to the point that really needs to be said. We're not yeah. talking about, again, frank conversations about the state of education we're still trying to implement things that we know not it is not that it is plateaued the school to prison pipeline it's increasing steadily we yeah. talk so much about data we talk so much about this that, and the other but if we look at the data we know that this doesn't work so why are we still doing this because it's comfortable and, and so we have to look at we, so so this is the thing we have to look at who's who's doing the doing Come on now. Yeah, well, I'm trying to be nice. We, okay, we... well, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you this data. Okay. Uh, when when we when we integrate it, okay, so eighty something percent of educators of color lost their job. Okay. So that means that those who were um, benefiting from the structures of Jim Crow and um, desegregation or in, a, in a, uh, yeah, desegregation. Yeah. desegregation, we'll take that. Segregation, 
were then in charge of bodies who they had never felt were human. So we're looking at 1968 to now. And no one has really done a good job of training educators. So we're looking at 84% of educators are, are white females, right? No one's done a really good job of training those educators and even black educators. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Get to okay. it, get to I'm it. Get to get to that in a minute. Because we in Dallas, but, <laughs> Dallas. But I'm gonna let you I'll go. I'll just say this, in general, there's no real good yes. training. And no, let me say this, there's no mandatory training. Yes. That says to be in front of a diverse group of students, you need to have this level of um, understanding, empathy, compassion, social emotional learning skills, and um, just a, a certain toolbox when it comes to your pedagogy to reach them. Because you can get a certification off of just knowing basics. Yes. Just the basics, not the human, just the basics. And we're teaching humans. Make that make sense. Really does, man. And, and what's scarier is, what's scarier is we don't know as community, as a community, as parents, um, and I try to tell my friends this, when you send them to these schools, you need to be ready to have your gloves on at all times. At all times. Because what your child is going to tell you, and this is what my, my two nieces came back and I was, I was, <laughs> I was ready but they are off in a predominantly white school district and they were being mistreated. And what I told my, my sister, now she's not my blood, but you know how we are. Yeah. Okay, you know how we are. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is my sister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I told her, I said, let them come home one more time and complain about. I said, I'm gonna come up there because <laughs> what I do understand is this, you may have not learned how to teach us, but you're going to learn how to be without a job. If you you're don't learn today, how to say you're going to learn today, you're going to learn today. <laughs> Try me. Try me. And so we haven't, I haven't heard any more complaints, <laughs> but, but I'm very clear on this. I'm very clear on this. My mom and daddy didn't play, play about me and our parents have to learn to hold educators accountable. Yes, yes. Okay. And systems. The systems. And systems. Yes. yes. Systems. So you're the policy man. <laughs> How do parents engage with you? This is my question to you. So, you know, I, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that. I want you to talk about what it means from a black perspective on what you're talking about mm -hmm. like so we're going to get to that and then we're going to move into a, a into seeing what it looks like for you right okay. as a policy person i am still struggling with the fact that we're we're telling we're telling we don't we, we're fighting over shall and may we're not talking about creating new policy. We're talking about whether the district give tells a, a principal shall or may. That's two years of fighting for for one word of saying no. You are going to implement this at your at all schools because we know that it fights this. We haven't even started talking about like they, we keep fighting. We're all of that needs to be scrapped. My biggest thing is, you know, they didn't have no problem making Jim Crow laws that spoke specifically to what black people couldn't do. They didn't have no problem specifically writing, changing laws on the fly about how kids couldn't, black kids couldn't do this and that. So when are we gonna just scrap all these laws? We don't need to be talking about shall or may. We need to say that at every school, this is what we will be done. 
Booker T. Washington fought for for uh, career readiness. We had someone else. We had uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, I can't think of his name right now. It won't come to me. But he fought for liberal arts. Um, what was his name? Uh, can't think of it now. Anyway, both of those need to be in our schools. They mm -hmm. need to have what so culturally relevant teaching that is specific to you don't I, if you don't want to taught it at, at that school and then you need to have that stating every school needs it needs to be district led these things I, i'm tired of fighting over shall and may you know i love saying? how you frame that i that's love how you frame over. that because that's what we're fighting so this is what my frustration, and, and I love how you, you frame that because that's exactly what it is. Um, my instinct is to not fight over Shaolin and May. Yeah, mine either. I knew, I know that. <laughs> I'd just, just rather do what I need to do. Right, thank right? you. And my instinct is to do what's best for the least of these. So yeah. however that however that happens to you doesn't matter to me. Yeah, yeah. Because these babies are more important to you, are more important than your feelings. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. And and they're definitely more important than how we've been doing things. Yes. Yes. Cuz it's not working. Cuz it's not working. And, and they're more important about battle. When we're talking about 2022, we're looking at 2019, 2020, 2021. These children have dealt with things that no one has experienced ever. So why are you trying to fix things with old ways? These are new problems. And not just always, but real always. Nothing has changed since the data has not changed since the data hasn't changed since it since 2002. We, Did we still quote people from 2002 and 2005? Yeah, yeah. Come on. So, man. so my concern is this. This is my concern. Um, do you want to be a part of transformation, growth, freedom? Freedom. Keep going. Okay. I got you. Or are you just comfortable? And are you benefiting from this in any kind of way? So when we just kind of go back to what we're talking about, when we talk about um, educators of color, okay? <laughs> are you comfortable? If you're comfortable, that's a problem. You shouldn't be comfortable. Not when we look at this data. No. No. If you're comfortable in these meetings and you're looking at data and you're not saying something. You're part of the problem. You're part of the problem. So to, to, to speak to that. So when uh, in my district, uh, I, I, I went to the assistant superintendent, black woman, love her to death, and went to who I, at that time I was um, reporting to um, uh, the director of CCMR. And I said, hey, we need to have an equity team. We need to have equity, blah, 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 you know. And the CCMR person was like, yeah, let's do it. You know, white woman. Yeah, let's do it. Black woman was like, I don't know. I don't know. But let me tell you why those two things were different. Black woman understood the roadblocks. White woman was like, oh, it sounds good. Because everything sounds good. Everything sounds good. Because we're not really about to do the work. Yeah. That it, come on now now now. Okay. okay. So either way, we start doing the work. Okay. And <laughs> um, with that work becomes me looking at where has this work been done before and, and has it been successful? And I, en I ended up identifying the work that's been happening in um, North Carolina, 
don't get me to naming the city because I don't want to get it wrong, but I identified this particular school district and um, they were doing some amazing equity work. I get them on the call with me, my assistant superintendent. And one of the things that he uh, said that resonated with me to this day, and this is maybe two years ago, but it just resonated with me, was we have to all be prepared for atonement, which means everybody has to say, how did we get here and how was I a part of that? Yes. So as, as educators of color, we have to be very clear that we've, we've played a role in where our children are. Yes. And if I can't say that 10 years ago, 20 years ago, five years ago, a year ago, I didn't speak up when I should have, I'm still going to be a part of the problem. If I can't say that I disenfranchised our children and families because I was getting a paycheck, I'm a part of the problem. I need to be able to say that so that we can all be on evil uh, on on equal that, plane. Yeah. Equal yeah. Plane. And so that's, that's the same thing. And, and, and so that's the thing that uh, Nazi Germany had to reckon with. And if the Nazis had to, you had know to, to, were forced to, were forced to, then little of us can figure that out, right? It should be simple. But egos, money, and, and power, and, 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 you know, and then also we have to understand that some of us are really a part of the system and we don't know it. We're in the matrix. Yeah, that's, yes, yes, yes. We're in the Matrix. The Matrix. And it is literally just the, the fact of, yeah, I won't even expound on that. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're in the Matrix. And, and we're waiting on Neo. But yeah, Neo it, is us. Neo should be each of us. Yes. And it's right. okay to say, it, it, it's okay to just, say this is bs yeah y'all not doing what and and this is what's going to happen in my classroom this is what's going to happen at my school this is what's going to happen at this like i said we have enough black administrators uh district workers eds uh, it, all that yeah. we have what we need people in places that can actually make some decisions experienced it today that if you understand what you're fighting for and you understand what we're actually putting in place, you can do the workaround. And if yeah. we're not fighting for the workaround and we're not fighting for what's going on. So I have, we have been on here. I did, we, I, we did more than what I wanted to. I wanted Sorry. to- No, 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 no. I wanted this to be, I, I, we talked about everything that I have planned to talk about. Tell me what do you think is the future of education? And I want that honestly. Like no holes. Oh, I loved, I love this question. Okay. I love this question because I felt like the uh, shutdown uh, gave us a glimpse of our future. So Kalima Preforce, who's like one of my favorite African American uh, STEM uh, gurus, right? Um, uh, he's out of the Bay Area, originally from New York. Okay. Uh, he has an amazing, amazing, amazing story. But he, at one point, was um, doing these uh, competitions for, for children in disadvantaged areas to create apps that would essentially save their lives, right? right. And uh, one of the, the students... Um, I can't think of his name right now, and I really should be ashamed because that kid is amazing, but right now I can't think of him. But he created an app that would have saved um, Trayvon Martin's life. Oh, wow. Okay. So the future of education is this. It's filled with empathy. It's filled with understanding uh, social justice. 
And it's also filled with understanding that all of those things that we think are like not, not going to matter, those are the things that are going to open our brains up to be better humans for ourselves and for each other. That's the future. Um, but it also has technology. So what I would love is for all of those educators who can't understand Excel, Google, and other apps, I need them to retire. Okay. I need y'all to go away. All right. Love you. And they'll get towards it because I struggle with all of that. I don't struggle with Excel or anything. It's just the mindset. Okay. Right? But this is the thing. If your students are teaching you how to log in. Oh, well, no. No, we're not doing that. If your stu students are teaching you how to use the things that your district's asking you to use, go ahead and retire, baby. Yeah, yeah, no. This ain't for you. <laughs> this ain't for you. Your, your students shouldn't be ahead of you, is what I'm saying. In, yeah. in technology. So when it comes to technology, education will be pushed forward. I can literally get online and connect with someone across the world. Yes. If yes. your teacher cannot do that right now, bye-bye. Because yeah, that's, that's, that's you're not a global educator. And our students need to be global learners. Yes. Yes. I will take that. I will take that. And if you're not there, at least be willing to. At least be willing to learn. Yeah. But what you can't be is relying on a uh, Regine to log you in to one of these apps. Regine can't, can't teach you. Regine can't teach you. Um, you know, Kelly can't. Karen, Karen, Karen needs to retire. Miss yeah. Thomas needs to retire. You know, I can go on. But what I'm saying is, is that. If you are not of uh, the willingness, like you said, to learn, this ain't for you. 2020, 22 ain't for you. It's yeah. really moving towards that. And it is, you know, it, it, it's, thank you. So I don't have to say it. I, I needed, I needed educated to say that simply because, and if we can't, I think if we can't, because there is a side of this that, like you said, the things that we don't consider that important. Yeah. We're still focusing on testing when that has zero to do. Yeah, we're gonna do another show about that. But yeah, 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 all of that. I'm gonna let my intern come and talk about that because she is passionate about that foolishness. Young, young, young Caucasian intern in social work. That is so uh, passionate. Is that the one who interviewed me before? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. All that y'all not doing. We're not. We're not qualifying anything. Yeah. And stop. Stop taking our money that we could be focusing on building up these kids' self esteem. On um, finding out, like you said, an anchor man that that's going to help them get the job. That's going to tell them about what it is to be entrepreneurship needs to be yeah. brought in. That all of this needs to be done because we're not teaching our youth. We're indoctrinating them into a system that is no longer viable, never was viable for us, but it's definitely not viable now. So yeah, I'm going to let you do all of your shameless plugs right now for your <laughs> organization, for what you do, whoever you want to shout out. This is my time. This is your time for that. So ladies okay. and gentlemen, pay, pay close attention to how you can <laughs> contact, interact, and hire. Let's figure out where that money's going to go. <laughs> so I will say this. I, I can't leave without saying that um, my colleagues and I are writing a book called Sister Syllabus. Nice. Uh, and it is Dr. Michelle Neely, who is one of the most brilliant educators I've ever met. She was a part of the Barack Obama Male Leadership Academy, nice. which was uh, her and Nakia Douglas's work. Oh. Uh, transformational education. Okay. It, it, it's never been duplicated since they left. And I'm going to say that. That's a strong brother. And I'm just going to say that after they left, it's never been duplicated. And then also um, Aaliyah Rashan, who mm -hmm. is um, brilliant minded advocate, at activist, 
educator as well. Um, but, but her strength lies in her ability to not just be a wife, a mother, but then also an educator. So she comes from so many different spaces, both of them do. Um, but our work with Sister Syllabus, uh, we are interviewing, still in the interviewing process of uh, interviewing women of color who have been in the education system and how do we fight for ourselves and our students. Um, because what often is left out of the conversation is, um, and I'll quote one of the, the educators I'm, I'm, I'm working with now, my first, probably the first week I was in the administration building, uh, I, I just left a, 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 a school and I was just kind of blown away with how they were treating black boys. And I made a comment towards her, she was an African, older African-American woman with a doctorate. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This like <laughs> good, but keep going, go earned, earned doctorate. And I said, I can't believe they were doing this. And she was like, well, if you can't imagine that, you won't imagine how they treat us. Mm. So that led me to, that part of that led me to um, trying to discover not just what is happening with our children, but what is happening with African-American educators, yes. uh, particularly women. So it's called Sister Syllabus, and uh, we are working on that. And the website is sistersyllabus.com. Very nice. Is there anything you need to do for your organization? Um, so Bridging the Gap mentoring, that, uh, mentoring program, I have put that on hold only because okay. the work I'm doing right now, I'm getting paid to finally do. Hey, <laughs> so, hey, hey. And I was funders. doing the same thing before. Yes, was yes. Oh, God, this is, good. This and funders. I'm going to stand this. I'm going to stand this because we talk with this goes in front of people that, that have some money. And we're talking about, listen, we're not, we're no longer focusing on outcomes that are not responsive that that are that are not talking about true change we're talking about let's start funding on mindset everyone else gets it come on so there's there's a few organizations if you go back through this that are talking about changing mindsets focus on funding for mindsets focus on funding for how somebody thinks, whether they succeed or not. It's the fact that you changed how they think. That's what our kids need. If you want to feel good about your money, come check this sister out. Donate. <laughs> Look her organization up. Look up who she's working with and figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and before we end, um, I just want to honor my ancestors, Moses Lee Osborne, Evangeline Osborne, Armelia Street, and uh, and John D. Street, the D stood for damn straight. <laughs> um, and 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 um, just know that um, I I'm 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 standing on shoulders. I'm standing mm -hmm. on uh, Cindy Boyd. I'm standing on Dr. Lee Alvoid. I'm standing on Michelle Bailey. I'm standing on shoulders. And so, very. Nice. I hope that never gets cut out. That needs to be. It. No, 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 no. This, that, this is uh, all of this. The, the, the break and everything is going in there. I don't care nothing about that. This is frank conversations. I didn't okay. come here. I don't have any any limits. I That's what it. we need to start doing. That's how we need to start interacting at schools. This is how Very we need real. to start interacting at school boards. This is how we need to interact when we're talking about policy, when we're doing all these things, because what we're doing is not working. Oh, speaking of school boards, I'll be in contact soon. After okay. March 27th. Okay. It's about, it's about to get real. Okay. It, 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 uh, yes. I, I'm going to, let me stop this recording because then I'm about to. We, we stop recording, to stop. please. Yes. Thank you for joining <laughs> us tonight at, uh, for our, our pep talks. Again, from now on, it will be recorded and then uploaded. Uh, follow us. Do what you need to do. We could use our support as well. Um, so could everyone else that's actually doing work in the community. Thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you, Mia Street, for joining and for being here. And I look forward to, to collaborating with you in the future. We will. Uh, let me see how, there it is. Have we stopped?